This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Whisper Room, and Eventide. So get ready to rock. How do you know if a song is good? If you like it, if it makes you feel like you're better off for having heard it, if it makes you happy, makes you tap your foot, if it makes you want to dance, if it makes you want to sing along, if it does any, all of those things or just one of those things, you got a good song. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. If you're sick of bothering the neighbors when you are trying to record your music or ruining your recordings with outside noises, but you're not ready to spend a ton of money on permanent studio construction yet, then consider getting a Whisper Room ISO booth for your studio. Whisper Room offers the instant solution for a comfortable, quiet, ventilated, portable ISO booth with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booth when you mention recording studio rock stars. Go to to whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. What do Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Mike Kozowski, Dave Pensato, and George Massenberg all have in common? They all have great things to say about Eventide. Originating in a New York City basement in 1971 with the original Instant Phaser and H910 Harmonizer, Eventide continues to transform the sound of music with the iconic H9000 Harmonizer, visionary guitar effects like the H9 pedal, and now a whole suite of incredible plugins for your studio. Go to eventide.com to learn more or click the link in the show notes below. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and used Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac. The speed to create, the capacity to dream. Find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. Hey Rockstars, it's your host Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals and songwriters so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Tommy Womack, a singer, songwriter, author, humorist, and Kentucky native. Tommy got his start in 1985 to 1992 with the legendary Bowling Green-based punk rock and college radio fave band Government Cheese, whose story he immortalized forever in his cult classic book, The Cheese Chronicles, which I highly recommend you read. Upon moving to Nashville in 92, Tommy became known for his long working relationship with Will Kimbrough, starting with their bands The Biscuits. The Biscuits uh, made one classic album for John Prine's O Boy label in 93, and their band Daddy, also um, Tommy and Will's band, have made two albums and enjoy a three. following now. Oh, three. 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 Okay, we so. had one come out last year called Let's Do This. Oh, sweet. I guess that dates the bio then on the website. <laughs> <laughs> Something to update. Since 98, Tommy's released seven solo albums, the latest being the brand new Namaste, and he looks forward to the new songs coming out from that, in addition to uh, songs like Nice Day, Vicky Smith Blues, and Alpha Male and the Canine Mystery Blood. And uh, the Alpha Male song I already have in the YouTube playlist for you, rock stars. If you want to go listen to Tommy's music, um, you'll find that in the show notes. Um, in addition to writing the book, The Cheese Chronicles, Tommy's also the author of the comic Civil War novella, The Lavender Boys and Elsie, and the recently published Dust Bunnies. He's written for many magazines, including the Oxford American, and is a regular contributor to the East Nashvilleian magazine. Tommy's songs have been covered by Jimmy Buffett, Todd Snyder, Jason and the Scorchers, the Dell Lords, Scott Kemper, Dan Baird, and Homemade Sin, and many others. And I'm psyched to be talking to Tommy today about playing in bands, making records, 
songwriting, and even writing books. Although I don't know that I aspire to be much of a book writer, but we'll see. Please we'll see. Yeah, please welcome Tommy Walmart to Recording Studio Rockstars. Tommy, you ready to rock, dude? I am ready to rock. I got my espresso here that you kindly made me. Uh, let's do this thing. Right on, dude. Well, welcome to the studio. You've been here before. Been here before. We transferred some tapes over here before, as I recall. Yeah, we were transferring... Um, Cheese Chronicle, or uh, excuse me, the government cheese Over, recordings yeah, old from government cheese recordings. Yeah, which which sounded amazing, man. Those were really cool sounding uh, recordings. Yeah, yeah, did. something might happen to them now that we got them digitized. It's something someday, maybe. So the the ones that we transferred didn't release yet. No, they're unreleased. Uh, we put out a big anthology of everything that had ever been released, and a lot of unreleased stuff. And this is stuff that hadn't gotten transferred digitally, so it was out of the running. But uh, and but I may just, I don't know if I'll sell the guys on doing it, but I may just get a wild hair up someday and pay for putting out 500 copies of it for whoever wants it. Um, as I recall, they were recorded up in Bowling Green, Bowling Green, and then transferred to ADAT, which we then transferred into Pro Tools. That's right, and that's where they live now. Were they first on analog tape? I would assume, yeah, eight track probably, analog tape. Yeah, and it has such a great sound, man. I'm gonna I want to circle back and talk about how you guys recorded that stuff um, as we do the podcast. But sure. Before we get into all that. Give us, uh, despite the fact that reading the Cheese Chron Chronicles is probably the best way to to get your backstory, give us a brief brief introduction to who you are in your own words and um, tell us how you got into all this stuff. Well, I'm a 56-year-old singer, songwriter, author, freelance columnist, blah, blah. Lived in Nashville 27 years, got here in 92, but I've been playing here since 85. I... Um, Grew up in Madisonville, Kentucky. It's a coal mining town in the western part of the state, and it's the kind of place you either mine coal or farm soybeans or get the out. So so I went to college. You can swear on this podcast. Yeah. You're, you're I can familiar. swear on this podcast? Oh, yeah, totally. Oh, yeah. Well, my mother wouldn't like that, but she's dead, so that probably won't be a problem. Uh, I went to Western Kentucky University in Bowling Green from 1980 to 84. All I wanted to do was play in a rock and roll band. My parents begged me stay in school. I said, Mama, I want to take my guitar and go down to Nashville. Please, son, stay in school. So I did. And uh, I graduated in December of 84, went downtown Bowling Green, got a job as a cook and a fried chicken restaurant and started government cheese and and as John Lennon would say now it's all this you know that's <laughs> that that's how it got started and well you guys had some real success with that band i mean you know uh it was sort of a still do yeah still do and it was a wonderful story of um it, you know it struck me you can you can correct me if i'm wrong but i think of you guys is coming up through that indie band scene of the 80s, you know, the self-starters yeah. and, you know, hop in a van and tour the country and Absolutely. make things happen. The REM paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, when REM happened and then we saw Jason and the Nashville Scorchers up close and saw what they were doing, that tickled the whole idea in my mind that it was possible to be a Southern rock and roll band without being the Marshall Tucker band or Skinner or anything that Southern rock could mean something else and, and, and could be done just get in a van. Um, the drinking ages were more lax back then. You could drink when you were 19 in Tennessee then. And, uh, there were gigs to be had and a whole bubble of the population in college that want to want to see the gigs and we just played and we played and we played and we developed some good followings and we were a damn good rock and roll band we were primitive uh yeah, but you guys we, were tight you're powerful i've seen yeah you know, yeah we were tight on, on youtube yeah. i mean you guys uh, the live stuff you guys are playing your ass off yeah we played all the time as many nights a week as we could it's what we were living on barely uh and we lasted till 92, but we've had reunion gigs so often ever since that I don't remember how many reunions we've had. 
The last one was uh, in April of last year in Louisville, sold out headliners, and that was a good gig. And I want to play again sometime soon, but the band feels like we need something special to promote or something when we do a gig. So Yeah, I guess that never a, goes away, does it? No, nah, no. Nah, uh, we just want it to be an event and that people will show up instead of, oh, it's government cheese. Well, we saw them last year. We'll see them next year. No, right, we right. don't want it to be that. Well, um, I saw you guys first, I think it was in 1986 when I went to Washington University in St. Louis. Yeah. And it was my freshman year and they were having, you know, Friday night parties in the, in the food cafeteria and a band playing. Mm -hmm. And I go down there and there's this band rocking out. And as I recall, you guys covered Pinball Wizard and I thought that was cool as shit. Yeah. I think that was the night of a double bill with the creature from the Black Lagoon. That sounds about right. They showed the creature from the Black Lagoon, and then we played. And yeah, Pinball Wizard, I think that happened. You know, a lot of gigs you just don't remember when you've done show after show for 35 years. There's a lot of them you just don't ever remember. But I remember that night. Right. I remember that night. Because I was there. Because you were there. <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, so, you know, hearing you talk about seeing Jason and the Scorchers, too, it occurs to me that for you, um, maybe it took till the mid-80s for the 70s to be over, for it to feel like that, you know, that, that Southern Rock was no longer a, a 1970s thing with Leonard Skinner, but it, was, it now belonged to the indie rock bands of the 80s. Well, uh, it revolutionized the South. So many bands came out, especially from Athens, that uh, uh, were college kids. And college kids uh, have this hip contingent to them always who were not interested in hearing Free Bird or uh, One More Silver Dollar. Or, uh, they wanted to hear the Patti Smith group and The Clash and uh, The Specials and big star and the velvet underground and um and that's the f soil that you know yoko ono um that's the soil w that you got the b52s from and rem and uh uncle green great forgotten band love tractor um, and it inspired bands all over the American South, including Government Cheese, including all the bands that happened in Nashville, the Royal Court of China, the Questionnaires, um, Walk the West. Um, it was it was it was an extraordinary time from when I got in the game in '84 through through well into the '90s. It was an extraordinary time, a uh, lucrative time if you can call it lucrative, um, time to be in a band or form one. You had you had a chance to get in a van and go get yourself some gigs. Yeah, well, you guys were probably getting paid enough to have a, a hotel or a couch to sleep on and, you know, the the requisite loaf of white bread and bologna. That was about it. To eat in the van on, on the tour, right? That was about it. A lot of Wendy's, a lot of Shoney's. Uh, crash pads whenever we could. Um, I slept in a living room in Johnson City that the front glass of the bay window was broken out. It was 38 degrees outside, and there was a tarantula in an open bowl on the coffee table. <laughs> That's a true story. That some some nights were like that. Yeah, I remember waking up um, on a or like sleeping in a basement on a old moldy couch. I think it was in Louisville somewhere, and I couldn't get off the couch and roll over or like step off because there was broken glass all over the floor. <laughs> you know, it's one of those. And then also, uh, I also I do recall trying to go to sleep in a bathtub once in the bathroom is the only location left and then being woken up by somebody using the bathroom while I was in there. And it, it, you know, the air wasn't quite as uh, breathable at that point, but all right. So um, I'm going to jump to the next question, Tommy. I like to sh ask guests to share an inspirational quote on the podcast. Get us, 
kicking off and excited about music and hitting the studio. Have you got anything that you want to share? Do I have anything ins- inspirational to say to anybody who wants to make their own record? Yeah. Make your own record, your own record. Because there's a lot of people that's making records uh, using other people's opinions and stuff. But uh, there are no record companies anymore. There are no hit records anymore. There are no uh, music scenes such as we knew them to be. It's all global now. There's a jizz million records being come out with every five seconds. So make your own record. Make something you want to make. Punk Rock won. We're we're in control of our own careers now, for better and for worse. Uh, Make your own record. Do you have stories of uh, sort of getting off the path yourself with your music or with your band where you, you tried to follow everybody else's lead and then finally came around to doing your own thing? Well, that's that's the story of Government Cheese right there. We started off as 50% Jason and the Scorchers and 50% R.E.M. And over the course of a couple of years, we uh, developed into our own sound until uh, we eventually got to be a a big sound and power chord guitar band. Uh, Change happens. And, you you know, who's going to buy your next record if it sounds just like the one before it you know yeah that's a good point so you talk about the idea of um you know finding something new to say with each album yeah don't you you know don't you love bands that do that i mean the beatles said something new every time out bob dylan certainly did um is uh if you can make Consistently great albums that change uh, from record to record, but never lose the spirit of what started the band. That that's that should be the goal. Yeah. Um, have you seen uh, change that's too much, either for your own records or with other bands, where something like just went too far? Yeah, yeah. There's um, um. R.E.M., to bring bring them up again, right around the monster record, the umbilical cord severed between me and them. I just never got that album. The next one after that was even more impenetrable, and then Bill Berry left, and when he left the band, he took way more from the band than he's probably getting credit for. And I never listened to them after that. Again, any of those post-Bill records. Um, So they're one that kind of lost it for me. But the big one, I love early Tom Waits. He wrote such great songs. Yeah. Uh, And he's still a great artist. I'll grant because so many people love him. And I I know I'll get crucified for saying this, but man, Tom Waits lost me when he started banging on pots and pans and every song was a 1933 German cabaret minor key, <laughs> what have you, you know, the pots and pans and the German cabaret thing. I'm, I'm just not into Tom anymore. <laughs> I think of, when I think of Tom Waits, I think of Tom drums and, and uh, trombones. Mm-hmm. You know, and he likes that. I'm not, I'm not, I was never a bit, a huge Tom Waits fan. So I've got, I, I'm not like a, um, you know, a, a rock historian as far as uh, Tom Waits goes. Yeah, I, I just, I'm just not smart enough to get his new stuff. Recording Studio Rockstars Academy is the place you can go to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level. And you can start right now with my free introduction to mixing course, Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro-sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you are in Logic, Cubase, PreSonus Studio One, Reaper, or anything else. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Well, let's see. How about for you guys? Um, 
Can you describe any kind of failure moments for you with your your band or with your own records that turned into a good learning experience for you? That describes my entire career. (laughs) (laughs) It's been one failure after another. And some of them have slowed me down and some of them have sped me up, depending on what condition I was as a person when it happened. Uh, around 19, late 1988, I noticed a feeling in my bones that government cheese just wasn't going to make it. We had signed a really bad record management and publishing deal with one guy, which is a tremendously uh, ludicrous thing to do for any band. And so we were, our careers were out of our control. I had heard the new record, it, and I heard it one day in, in a weird frame of mind and realized that the record sucked by the standards of the times. The recording wasn't very good. That uh, The first two government cheese records, the first one was done on eight-track analog, which is great. The two records that came out on the Reptile label were were 32-track digital machines, and we're talking 1987 and 8 yeah, that we recorded those, this stuff. Those Mitsubishi machines. I they think. were 3M. Oh, 3M, wow. 3M, and they ran on two-inch analog tape recording all the digital information. Wow. And... Nobody, it, you can't, not to slag the production team of those records too much, but nobody knew what they were doing. I'm sure they plugged microphone cables straight into the board without any thought that you might have to put some compression on this. Or Nowadays, everybody knows, you know, before you go to the... Uh, track on the computer you put it through a tube compressor to get some warmth on it you put it through a bit of a limiter so you don't risk digital distortion which doesn't sound good whereas analog distortion does you do everything you can now to make the signal that's going to digital get it as analog sounding as you can before it goes there they did not do that in 1987-88. Those records, the Michael Romanowski did a great mastering job, and the records sound much better on the two CD cheese anthology than the original record did. Um, digital was very tinny. The bass was uh, not warm. Um, it was it was just a terrible way to record then and. Um, to paraphrase Winston Churchill, the current Pro Tools recording system is the worst possible system except for all the other systems. That's what we got to deal with now, unless you want to spend $8 billion for analog tape. And, and, um, what are some things you remember? I mean, you're describing some of them, but, but, um, you know, you're, you're describing, analog experience being kind of a sonic thing. Were there other elements to the to making music and making records when it used to be on analog tape that sort of turn you off now with digital? Or um, is it really more strictly a sonic characteristic of things? It's just a sonic characteristic. I mean, I'm, I make my records in Pro Tools because it's easier. And they got it to where it sounds pretty good, you know? Um, I, I do love to put the basic tracks on a, on a two inch twenty four track machine and get the drums and the bass and the piano and the guitars on that, and then bump that over into Pro Tools because that seems to help a little bit. Yeah, and then you finish it up with with the vocals and the all the things you're going to have to edit very precisely and tambourine and 
Morocco, whatever you Do want to put you on. You have to edit your tambourine very precisely. <laughs> you have to edit your tambourine very precisely. And you can do that because you can see the tambourine wax on a screen in front of you. And you can gray them out and scoot them a little bit with this error. That's that's how come so many people sound so good playing tambourines on records now. <laughs> so now well, tell us about your studio. Do you have a home studio with Pro Tools I, that allows you to do anything. I these tried things. to make a home studio, and it's a joke. Uh, I have no engineering acumen. My, I do make demos. I do record. I do use GarageBand uh, on my computer, and I actually make some good sounding demos. You know, actually, but it's uh, it's very much the Paul Westerberg kind of version of solo recording where everything is really lo-fi. Um, I have this, what they call the snowball mic that fits on a little stand, and I just set it on the floor, the amps on the floor next to it. I'm singing live and uh, might have the headphones on with a click track, and then I just add bass but it's it's not going through any soundboard it's just going through a microphone into the laptop yeah and that's my demos and they generally get the point across yeah well all right so let's um let's 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 go to this question from demo then you're like i've got the song recorded um i want to i want to make a record now what's the next move for you when you've got demos and you're like all right it's time to make a record next move right now is to do it piece by piece I did I have two tracks that I have a new single out a 7 inch 45 RPM vinyl single from Need to Know Records in San Francisco I recorded two tracks over at Doug Lancio's and so there was that the the fun of recording two songs and now they're out on the record and there's still candidates for the next album I'll do I did one, I did two days of sessions with Jonathan Bright over at his place in the Nations a couple of weeks ago, uh, working on a cover of uh, Cole Porter's Miss Otis Regrets, uh, as Teenage Fan Club might have played it. Nice. And um, so that's in the can, and we're going to get together next week again. Uh, and I'll be, and I'll pay for two days at a time to get basic tracks down, maybe take everything somewhere to get overdubbed at the same time and then mixed. How many people yeah. are there for basic tracks? Do you, do you t like to make sure you've got a drummer and a bass player and a guitar player and something, or do you find one producer to just kind of go collaborate with and get? I usually do it just with a producer. There's a lot of stuff. Uh, that that has that starts with a click, and I put an acoustic guitar down and a vocal, and uh, we build around it. There are a lot. the The Government Cheese reunion album had no click tracks. We recorded that all live as a band together. Um, I. I used live drums with uh, no clicks for a great deal of the Namaste record. But uh, generally what I do is um, I we get a click or, or even a good drum pattern. I do an acoustic guitar and a vocal over that. And when I get the right acoustic guitar and vocal track, that's it. And I almost never re-sing the song. That, right. That's the final vocal right there before anything else is added. And the acoustic and the vocal happen at the same time? or do Happen you do at the acoustic? same time. All right. And if I, if I have to perfect the vocal again, then I have to wipe that guitar as well and put another one on because of the bleed. Right, right. Yeah. Do you have any favorite uh, mics that seem to keep reappearing for your acoustic and for your vocal? The SM7 is nice for uh, for the vocals. Um, I don't know the name of um, the shotgun acoustic guitar mic that sounds nice, 
But uh, it's probably a condenser mic, so so yeah. a dynamic on your voice, but a condenser sort of sounding hi fi on the acoustic. Yeah, yeah, it's a good good choice. All right, cool. Um, how about the decision that happens for you about? acoustic and electric guitar why are you playing acoustic when or or ever are you playing electric guitar i mean you go back and watch government cheese and here's this you know kid rocking out on stage on a on a telecaster Mm -hmm. like a punk rocker um what what helps you decide what direction you want to go with your instrument and what kind of music you want to write and record well i put on the electric guitar later for sure on a bunch of it and uh, uh, the next record is going to be very electric guitar. Um, I've I I want I like to play electric guitar live on stage more than I like to play acoustic guitar, even though I enjoy that a lot too. Um, because you get to bring out all your gear, and I'm a gear nerd. I got all my guitars. I get to make noise with them. There's a drummer there. But you can't make a living on the road anymore at my age with a band. You have to go out solo acoustic. And it's a totally different thing. And I'm still playing rock and roll. The songs I'm playing are rock and roll songs to me. They might sound bluesier or folkier or countryer or whatever. But... That's the way I got to play. I play less and less like that. Only economical way to do it is to sort of reinvent myself as a singer-songwriter, uh, which I've been able to do. And um, I have I have people who like me and know me for the singer-songwriter persona. I have a whole lot of people who like me and know me as the government cheese guy or the biscuits guy or the guy who wrote those books. Um, I would love to tour with a band every night. And I dream of a day when maybe that could happen. Uh, Not likely. But when I play in Nashville now, I do my best to get a band together every time because I don't want to do that another guy with a wooden guitar kind of thing. I do it. I don't want to hear anybody else do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good uh, insights, though, as a reminder that, you know, you can rock with a band, and when you want to go out and support your music, you know, it makes a lot of sense to get comfortable playing them acoustic by yourself so that you can go out and tour. And I know you do a lot of house concerts. You yeah, know? I do a lot of house concerts. I got concerts. friends who still host house concerts in St. Louis, and I'm always seeing your announcements for that. Um, and then, you know, but yet it doesn't mean you let go of your passion for being in a rock band, and that happens when it can happen. It's about making all those pieces go together. Um, do you find that some songs you need to write on the electric guitar, or can you write them on the acoustic and know what the electric's going to do? Um, generally the latter, um, I, I have, I'll have a page of lyrics and, uh, I start with words. You start with words. 90% right. of the time. And, um, I get on the acoustic guitar and, uh, I figure out the changes. And once I got the changes down and I can do a quick mock-up demo, of me singing the song and playing the acoustic guitar, then I can hear what the electric guitar has to be and do the electric guitar and maybe even get rid of the acoustic guitar I had to begin with. Um, meaning I'd have to re-sing it, of course. But uh, there's 90% of the time there's a guitar found acoustic guitar foundation on what I do even if it's more felt than heard there are songs that are written on on the electric guitar too and um there's there's songs that have a little more uh trickery to them when you just strum an electric guitar like you strum an acoustic guitar uh, it can sound really great and kick-ass, or it can sound really bad. 
Right. <laughs> what are some things that go into making it sound really great versus really bad? Riffs. If you have something interesting to play riff-wise, and if you can sing over the top of it at the same time, then sure, lay down your electric guitar and your vocal at the same time. I'm not a riff master that way off the cuff. You know, I got I to gotta listen to something make it up and then learn how to sing over the top of it if I can. And I don't have the chops that I had in the government cheese days. I could shred Lidge at one point back in the eighties. I could absolutely shred and I don't, I don't play that much anymore at home, you know? Right. Right. Um, that took daily, daily rocking out. Yeah, to yeah, to it home. took daily, daily. Uh, my day in 1986 was to get up around 10, smoke a bowl, pick up the guitar, and play guitar until it was time to smoke another bowl, and then I would play guitar some more. And, you know, 6 o'clock in the evening comes around, I'd find somewhere to go and play guitar. And that was my life. And, you know, things change. And um, fortunately, your core chops don't go that far away. I can still pick up a guitar right now and play reasonably well. And I have much better tastes in my phrasing now than I did. I still enjoy playing guitar. And I can still, I can still play Weedly Wee a little bit. But I also hire a guy. I always have a hired gun on guitar that's better than me to be the lead guitar player. I've had uh, a cavalcade of just monsters. John Jackson played guitar for me the other night. He was with Bob Dylan for years. Kenny Greenberg played for me the gig before that. Um, Adam Fleurer has played gigs for me when he's not out with Leroy Parnell. Um Will Kimbrough has stepped in and played lead guitar for me. There are others, you know, and uh, Nashville's just an embarrassment of riches when it comes to finding a guitar player that's, that's first of all, fantastic, and second of all, complimentary. And what I really like doing is two guitars on a stage, two guitars, bass and drums, and the guitars just jam. And I tell the guy, whoever it is, John, Kenny, if you're playing a hot lead and I start stroking in there with little lead licks myself, don't you stop. Don't you just start playing rhythm all of a sudden. You keep going, and I'm going to go someplace with you, and it's going to sound like some girls by the stones, you nice. know, <laughs> the ancient art of weaving and all that. That's what that's what's so much fun to do. Yeah. That is so much fun to do. That's the kind of stuff that you can't really plan. You just have to be there in that No, you when can't it plan it at all. We barely rehearse whenever I have a band show. We rarely rehearse at all. For the band shows, you make a drop box with all the songs in it and the set list and everybody learns it and comes in and wham. And you don't, a lot of these guys, you don't want to rehearse them. Right. They'll play the best they're going to play it the first time they play it, which will be in front of an audience of 23 people at D's. Or, <laughs> or 38 people at the five spot if it's a really hot night, you know. Yeah, well, so it's good advice, though. I mean, you know, you you surround yourself with people that are better than you. Absolutely. And it, it brings up the quality of your own music. Have you actually experienced um, people liking your music and your songs better when you hire and work with better musicians versus when you have either worked with musicians that were only as good as you or worse or didn't have another musician there? Well, that kind of describes the work in progress that was government cheese and then the biscuits. And then when I got into my own thing um, and found what worked better for me over time, 
Yeah. I forgot the actual question. Yeah, that's pretty much that's pretty pretty good answer <laughs> right there. Um, cool. Well, hey, let's take a break for just a moment, then we'll come back in for the jam session. Rockstars uh again got um links to stuff we're talking about in the show notes. You can go over and check out Tommy's website. Make sure to go pick up his books. I highly, highly recommend that you check out the Cheese Chronicles. We're gonna talk more about that when we get back in here in just a second. Um, wonderful book about about government cheese and about Tommy's experience coming up through music. And um, also there's a YouTube playlist there so you can go listen to Tommy's music and records. We'll see you in just a minute for the jam session. It was 1971 in a New York City basement when Eventide revolutionized the audio world by introducing the world's first studio effects processor, the Instant Phaser, and the first digital effect, the H910 Harmonizer. Eventide soon followed with the Instant Flanger, Omnipressor, SP2016 Reverb, and H949 and H3000 Harmonizers, which have been favorites of A-list mixers like Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Mick Kozowski, and Dave Pensato, and heard on countless hit records over the decades. Today, Eventide brings all that sound to your stage and studio with modern solutions like the H9000 Harmonizer, their complete line of guitar pedals, including the versatile H9 Max, and transformative plugins like Micropitch, Physion, Black Hole, and Mangled Reverb. Take your next mix in your studio to a whole new level. Go to eventide.com or click the link in the show notes below. Are you sick of bothering family and neighbors when you're just trying to rehearse or record your music? Do outside noises or computer fans get into your studio mics and ruin your recordings? You could book a pro studio to record every time, but that would add up quickly, and doing permanent construction to soundproof your studio can easily cost up to $100,000 or more. Trust me, I know. And you can't take that with you when you eventually move the studio. Don't you wish it was an easy solution right now? Quisproom Isobooths offers a simple way to install a comfortable, quiet, ventilated isobooth in your studio with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums in a variety of sizes. For 30 years, Whisperoom has been solving studio isolation needs worldwide with isobooths that are shippable, portable, and can be assembled in an afternoon. Now you can get pro vocal recordings right in your home studio, practice whenever you want, and start using real guitar amps again. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booths when you mention Recording Studio Rockstars at whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio far into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. Hey, rock stars! We're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Tommy Womack, joining us on Recording Studio Rock Stars. Tommy, you ready to jam? I am ready to jam. Sweet. Tell us what the Cheese Chronicles is. Cheese Chronicles is a book I wrote, and it got published by Eggman Publishing in Nashville in 1995. And it is the story, the complete story of Government Cheese, the band I was in from 1985 to 1992, and which reunites once every couple of years ever since. It's the entire seven-year, 85 to 92 story of the band, everything we did, everything we went through, everything that was done to us, every bit of self-discovery self -discovery and uh, self-doing it to your selfie. <laughs> whatever the hell that means. It's the story of the band and 
it kind of um, it's it's kind of become a cult classic because it's a very funny book. If I say so myself, if you like what I think is funny, and uh, it kind of caught on in Nashville when it came out, and it's become known as sort of the Bible of touring young guys in vans, yeah, and girls. Um, I, it's it's done really well for me. It's kind of made my mark. Um, I became a minor celebrity in town because of that book in the late 90s when it came out. And I have had famous rock stars come up to shake my hand and tell me that they like my book when I couldn't believe this person even knew who I was. That's happened several times. I have gotten cards and letters from um, Mark, the guy from Hootie and the Blowfish, postcard from him one day. Mark Bryan wound up staying at his house once uh, on the road with Danielle Howell. He's got Platinum Record Award in his bathroom where I showered. You know, um, <laughs> Henry Rollins sent me a nice note. Uh, all, all, there's been tons of goodwill I've gotten over Cheese Chronicles because it pulls no punches. Everything happened. Everything. Um, I, you know, it, it reminds a lot of people of Hunter Thompson, too, which I take as a great compliment. Charles Bukowski, too. If yeah, you like Hunter Thompson and Charles Bukowski, you'll, not, you'll like Cheese Chronicles. There's just enough wildness in there, too, right? Yeah. Oh, and just enough profanity for the kids. Yeah. To make exactly. it fun. Exactly. So I remember when that book came out. Um, I can't remember if right when I got a copy and read it, it had just come out, but probably because I was at Alex the Great meeting you right around 95, right. 96, um, 97. And I think 97 was when I was on tour reading it. And I was with, uh, speaking of uh, for the girls too, I was in a band with um, Angie Carlson. Uh, it was a band called Grover, and she originally was married to Mitch Easter and, and was in the mm -hmm. band Let's Active. So we were I was asked to play bass on this tour, and we were pulling into New York City, and I'm reading your book about you guys pulling into New York City. And then I had one of those duh moments where I was like, oh, I think I need to put the book down for a minute and actually experience my own <laughs> pulling into New York City. <laughs> so that was kind of fun. And then there was another story about um, – I think it was Huntington, West Virginia, some crazy stuff happening. And it was oh, the same yeah. bar we had played where some crazy stuff had happened to us. And it just really resonated. It was a lot of fun to read. West Virginia. There could have been a whole book about just touring West Virginia. And I hate to offend any of your listeners in West Virginia, but I will go ahead and offend you. It is Freakville. Yeah, our lead singer got his jaw broke in Huntington, West Virginia. July, right outside the club or something. Right, right? outside the club, July 4th, 1990. <laughs> we had to finish the tour without him. He got sent home with prescriptions to die for. His jaw all wired up, and we finished the tour as a trio. No shit. And yeah. so you did all the singing. Did you sing his songs, or did I, you just cover your me own? Me and Billy Mack covered up the basses. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. That And... Uh, there was a club in Huntington where the band quarters were upstairs and all the food came brought in for us from pizza places and whatnot. We would go in there on Friday afternoon, load in, sound check, go up to our quarters upstairs, smoke a, bu smoke a whole bunch, come down, do the show, go back upstairs to the quarters, spend the whole next day playing all the video games, smoking bowls, go back on stage again, and never leave the club. That was Gumby's. We, yeah, Gumby's. That's, we did the same thing. Gumby's. <laughs> that was the place. There was a place across the street for breakfast. That's the only time you ever left the building for That's where three we got days. To, we got to open for Hazel Atkins there. Oh, oh, Hazel. Yeah, and it, and it was the first time, uh, well, I don't know when my kid's ever going to listen to this, but I guess no turning back now is the first time ever, somebody ever gave me acid and I tried a little bit and then I watched the the uh, the Hazel Atkins show and that was really cool. Well, the first time I did acid was in Charleston, West Virginia. 
There you go. It's about West Virginia, isn't it? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, it's a wonderful book, Rockstars. I highly recommend you go read The Cheese Chronicles. You can find that on Tommy's website. Do you want to share the link to that right now? Oh, yeah, all the links. Uh, TommyWalmack.com has links to lots. It, there's a store. You you can get the books on at the store. There are links to the Facebook pages, which is where I spend most of my time. I'm not very good about updating my own website, TommyWalmack.com. I am a presence at facebook.com slash Tommy Womack a lot. Okay, cool. That's where I daily post something. I don't do Twitter hardly at all. Um, and if you want a copy of Dust Bunnies or Cheese Chronicles or um, and, or The Lavender Boys, any of the books, you uh, go on Amazon and order them that way. You'll get them quicker, and I still get paid. Nice. Well, so tell us about Dust Bunnies. Dust Bunnies is uh, my second memoir. Uh, it's sort of a prequel and sequel to Cheese Chronicles, and it describes my descent into addiction, uh, describes a lot more misadventures on the road, uh, it zips back in time, back and forth in time between being three years old uh, to dealing with my dad uh, to hearing rock and roll for the first time to doing acid for the first time. For uh, it's about rock and roll. It's about modern day life, about being a father, about going to drug rehab, about waking up in jail about alcoholism, about God, about Jesus, masturbation. No politics, though? There's some politics <laughs> in there, I believe. Uh, I think it's a better book than Cheese Chronicles, but I don't expect everybody to agree with me because while it's, it's, very, it's a very funny book, but it's a little darker. Right, right. It's a little more, it's about the truth. Yeah, it has a happy ending though. You you'll you'll finish out the book feeling good about yourself and your life. All right, good good deal. I like those kind of movies. Um and then you also wrote another book uh that was a uh Civil War novella. Yeah, just what's that all just about? an experiment. That's totally out that was the second thing I ever put out in two thousand six, I think. Uh, the Lavender Boys is what they call an epistolary novella. It's letters back and forth between a sister of a closeted gay Confederate soldier and his letters back to her. And over the course of the Civil War, the closeted homosexual soldier, Albert, discovers the gay subculture at work in the entire officer corps of the Confederate Army. And through the guidance and shepherdance of one gay officer after another, Albert rises in the ranks, and eventually the South is running out of manpower. They're losing the war. And all the male nurses, who are all gay, are mustered in as their own regiment. And since they have the best-dressed costumes in the entire Pickett's Army, with knotted lavender handkerchief scars around their necks, they become the Lavender Boys. And so the book is, and the book is called The Lavender Boys and Elsie, and it's letters back and forth between Albert and Elsie, his crazy sister back home. Wow, that's a trip. Did and, that uh, did, did that also inspire songs for you? Yeah, one called Ophelia. I got a song about the Civil War called Ophelia that kind of has to do with the Lavender Boys and kind of not. I'm a Civil War buff. I'm surprised I haven't written more. Si oh, whoa, 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 whoa! There was a rec There's a song on my second solo record. They all come back for more. That's a Civil War song, and uh, Darwin Colston likes that song a lot. I think he's the only one. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't know what I think about that song anymore, but, um, but well, I did write one. Well, it's so a, uh, let's talk about songwriting. Let's, let's segue to that. <clears throat> um, you know, obviously there are all kinds of things that we can write songs about. 
Um, many of us, uh, many songs that are written probably have to do with love and relationships, um, and they can have to do with all kinds of things. How do you know what you want to write songs about? Um, do you consider yourself a storytelling songwriter? I'm a storytelling songwriter, and I don't write love songs for the most part, uh, which cuts me out in 90% of the songwriting market. Because it's all about love. That's what, you know, and I like love songs too. I just have never demonstrated much of a talent for it, but I have demonstrated a talent for uh, irony and seeing the folly in what people do and fear. Uh, I have written, my songs have a lot of love in them, but it's not, oh, baby, I want to take you home, love. It's, I love you, you're my only son, love. I love my wife, and here's why. Uh, There's love like that, but there's not, uh, you know, not, not a lot of typical songwriting love song material. I write songs about fish stick day at school, about yellow cling peaches, uh, Camping on Acid, um, Alpha Male and the Canine Mystery Blood is just an eight-minute diatribe about what it's like to live in the world today and try to hold down a job. 90 Miles an Hour Down a Dead End Street is an acapella rap about a drunken weekend in Indianapolis. Nice Day is about a wonderful day I had swimming with my son uh, while I was scared to death about the economic future and wondering how I was going to provide for my family. Cockroach after the bomb was about uh, perseverance and uh, still being here 30 years uh, at the time of the song coming out, um, 30 years of the music business trying to kill me. And here's something for you. The music business can't kill you. You have to voluntarily die. Right. (laughs) And the song's called a, cockroach after the bomb and i'm a cockroach after the bomb carrying on a bald-headed rocker with a good looking lawn you can't kill me i'm already dead i'm like that horseman ain't got no head a cockroach after the bomb carrying on and that's what i do that's my singer songwriter persona i'm the guy they can't kill um, talk about that rec- or that song for a moment. How did you? What was the writing process for that song? What was? What do you remember happening first? I do not remember writing a cockroach after the bomb at all. <laughs> One day I just had the song, and that has happened several, several times. There are several songs that are staples in my act, and I have no idea writing. I have no memory whatsoever of writing the songs. Um, how about stuff that you do remember? What, what can you tell us about your songwriting process? I mean, um, well, Alpha Male was written on cash register ribbon on the t- top of a bar, sitting at a bar in Franklin, Tennessee, watching a friend's band play. And it was written all on cash register ribbon because I didn't have a, any paper. And the bartender kept feeding me out longer and longer strips of cash register ribbon. I wrote that on that. Um I, what will happen a lot is I I have about six or seven loose leaf notebooks laying around the house. And and what, when a song comes to me, it comes to me with one line or one couplet. And I I go, oh, I got to write that down. And I find whichever book is nearest and convenient. And I start writing and I write it down. And then, uh, I, I go about what tasks I have to do in the house, load the dishwasher, whatever. I take the book around with me and write down more words until I can sit down after I've done my chores or whatever and finish it out. Um, songs kind of, you know, I, I don't like sitting down just to try to write a song. I don't like co-writing. I do it every now and then, but I don't like it. It's a chore. I like writing when it just hits me a song comes up and taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, here's a song. Get to work now. I like the fact that you describe it as, it's almost like the song accompanies you through the day, just follows you around wherever you're going and, and, it's, yeah. and you get to keep 
Keep yeah, working. It won't it. follow you around long. You got to write it down. You got to hop on the moment because it might be th- 30 minutes later and you go, what was that line I had? Yeah. That happens no. me all the time. You, you got to write it down when it happens. There's a reason there's seven, eight different loose leaf notebooks around the house. You got to write it down when it happens, especially my age. I used to be able to have a phenomenal memory for lyrics uh, in the songwriting process. Um, I wrote a song that Todd Snyder recorded called, called Betty Was Black and Willie Was White. And, and it's, I wrote it just as a rap, cleaning the house one day. Betty was black and Willie was white. Betty and Willie got it on one night. They climbed in a bottle of Tangeray and fell in love that very day. They sat by the fire and listened to jazz and had pretty little dreams like everybody has, but they had to be careful where they went out at night because Betty was black and Willie was white. I wrote all that while sweeping the floor and not writing down a bit of it. The theory being if the next line was memorable enough, I would remember it. And um, and I was able that I was twenty six or twenty seven at the time, and I could write songs like that without ever writing them down on paper. Yeah, um, there's a lot of songs I've got that I've never written down on paper, but it's getting harder to do that. Do you sometimes use the power of you know your phone to be able to just record the idea and do it that way, or do you still find that paper works best for you? Uh. The phone doesn't work very well because I tend to have pauses um, in in reciting something. I have to write it down and get the comma where I want it to be and stuff, and then I can make deliver it. But I can't just off the cuff using my voice say what the line is. Kind of like the way you describe the guitar riff and singing. Mm-hmm. It's better for you to work it out and then learn it afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what makes a good song? I mean, you know, it's a, it's a common message on this podcast that if we want to make a great record, it's got to start with a great song. So question is, how do you know if a song is good? How do you know if a song is good? If you like it, if it makes you feel like you're better off for having heard it, if it makes you happy, makes you tap your foot, if it makes you want to dance, if it makes you want to sing along, if it does any, all of those things are just one of those things, you got a good song. Like, um, and it's entirely subjective Anybody ever saying that's a good song is not stating a fact. They're stating their opinion. I don't particularly think Charlie Daniels' band Still in Saigon is a good song. I don't personally think that's a good song. But it's manna from heaven for somebody else, so God go with them. Um I think um, Philosophy of the World by the Shags is a great song, but God help you if you try to listen to it yourself. (laughs) Um, There's two musics, good and bad, and, and and that's all opinion. Right. And, and if you like a song, for whatever reason. And if you can't put a reason on it, if you just like it, it's a good song. Uh, you know, because, you know, I don't, I don't like, I don't particularly like Hold On Loosely by 38 Special, but I've sang along with it before. Yeah. And I know a lot of people love it. And I used to have contempt for people that just wanted mainstream songs thinly disguised about sex or heartbreak or whatever. I used to have contempt for people that listen to songs like that, and I don't at all anymore. I understand. I understand that uh, my job is as an entertainer, and it's not 
about confrontation anymore, like in the punk rock days. I'm an entertainer, and people work hard all day, and when they get off work, they want to go hear some songs that make them feel good and not have to think too hard, which uh, sometimes my, in my act, I, have, I make you think really hard. And if I didn't, I'd probably be a bigger artist than I am. And I don't blame the people who don't want to hear convoluted stories of addiction and misery and murder and uh, fish sticks. Um, they, they don't want to hear that. They want to hear, when you've been caught between the moon and New York City. <laughs> They you, and they and they deserve. They earn the right to not be made fun of because that's what they want to hear. Give them that, and I hope I give enough people enough of that sort of feel good stuff in my shows for them for them to like me. You know, but just be, just because I use, I, I would find my find something superfluous so far as the song goes. If it does it for somebody else, it's a good song. And God bless whoever wrote it, you know? Well, I think about sitting down to turn on the TV. And um, now my TV's got a couple options side by side. One of them is a, you know, like a Showtime app that I can watch some TV series that's entertainment and story-based. And another is YouTube app where I could pull up and I could be learning some cool stuff that I'm really interested in. Mm -hmm. And I find myself going back and forth. Sometimes I want to turn on my brain and learn some stuff. And then sometimes I'm like, I just want to watch this dumb show <laughs> so that I could just relax and not, you know, turn it off. And it's equally valuable. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you're ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own records, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is these techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you're using right now. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads for you to practice mixing and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. When you're identifying those things you mentioned about songs that that make it a good song to you, you know, like it moves you or whatever. Can you think of times where you you let your perspective slide on that because you got you got focused on this other thing and then acts and then you find yourself looking at what you just made and thinking, shit, man, that wasn't a good enough song that I just worked on. My first four solo records are riddled with unfinished songs. The second and third one are the worst offenders. They are riddled with songs that I wrote a good first verse and I had a chorus and I was so excited about finishing it that I rushed it and there are bad lines in songs, just plain bad lines. And when you have a bad line in a song, the song dies. How does that feel to have to sing that bad line later on stage? I don't. I don't do songs from my first few records anymore. I finally, with, with the There I Said It record in 2007, I finally made a record that all the songs are finished. I finally learned how to finish a song. And uh, instead of putting them out before they were fully grown songs. How do you finish a song? You give it time to incubate. You write the song, what you've got of it. Then you keep the piece of paper open on your, either open as a doc on your computer or open on your coffee table. And you live with it for a while. If you let a song incubate for just, you know, a few days at least, you might come up with better lines than what you had as opposed to being excited about it too quickly and recording it. There are songs from that era that I do new lyrics to that, and the songs are better 
but then I'll sell them a copy of it at the end of the night with the inferior version on it and get out of town quick because I took their money. <laughs> Do you sometimes have songs where you've written what you could lyrically, but you can feel that the arrangement isn't long enough and you extend the arrangement? Well, Elvis Costello will write a bridge that goes all over the place to get back to where he was talking about in the last verse he left off on. Um, some bridges are clunky. Some bridges are necessary. And sometimes you just don't need a bridge. Sometimes you just need the same four verses verse melodies over and over again. Tell your story, get in and get out. I'm, uh, you Have know. you written any songs with no choruses? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Lots of them. Just verse over and over. Yeah. Uh, God Part 3, I Want a Cigarette. Uh, uh, nice Day doesn't have a chorus in it. Uh, I write a lot of songs where it's the same chord progression over and over again, uh, and the lyrics are written in the folk form to that, a lot like Bob Dylan. I, I write a lot of songs like that that don't have bridges and don't have choruses, just a story. Nice. Um, what about the, the process of mishearing things? That's something for me where I've always been really excited creatively by mishearing something, like I'm... I'm not quite looking at it directly, and it sounds like a different bunch of words to me, and then all of a sudden it sparks ideas. Do you have a part of your process where you try to um, almost misinterpret what you're doing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll give, you know, every now and then on Facebook, I'll say something that I think is just funny as hell. But it crosses the line for a lot of people who ordinarily think I'm funny, but know that occasionally I go too far. And there's nothing like Facebook for you to go too far and have 200 people say, yes, you did. You know, um, I've been more careful with the books and the records to, to make sure that everything that gets left for posterity is, is not something that I shouldn't have put on there, you know? So, so, uh, social media is the safer place to make some mistakes, um, to make sure that what you're, what you're publishing for, for keeps well, is better. It's not a safe place for it, but, uh, but, uh, it's safer that, you know, hopefully if you have any sense by the time you are in the mixing or final stages of making a record, you sh you should be able to go, okay, I hear that song's wrong. No, that's not right. That's not how that should be. Let's go back to step four and start from there again, you know. Um, other writers that have turned you on, um, who are some other writers that you've admired? And um, is there anything about their process of writing that you always wanted to aspire to? Ray Davis. I wish I could aspire to his ability to draw characters and his melodies. Ray Davies is a, melodic, is a melodic songwriter. You can hum his lyrics and recognize a tune, and that is so rare. Lennon and McCartney could do it. Bacharach could do it. Brian Wilson could do it. Few others in rock and roll have ever been able to do that. It's, and um, if you can hum the lyric of a song, like Yesterday or... Waterloo Sunset, then that's a melody. Uh, Randy Newman, for his sketches of people, for his humor. Joe Strummer, for his commitment and his uh, fury. Um, Rick Nielsen, for his minimalist pop genius, Bob Dylan, most of all, last but not least, for his endless inventiveness while working within a very regimented form. Um, Bruce Springsteen, 
Uh, I don't think he's a good melody guy. I, he's not an innovator, and he himself admits he's not an innovator. But boy, can he arrange a song, and mm-hmm. boy, can he, can he pull you along? He can he can pull your heartstrings. Um, there are there are so many others. Uh, Todd Snyder is a brilliant songwriter. John Prine, obviously. My tastes don't actually run to Americana. I play it, but but what I listen to is rock and roll guys mainly, and and old blues guys. Muddy Waters and Willie Dixon wrote some great songs. Muddy wrote a few good ones himself, and of course Robert Johnson uh, was was an incredible songwriter. Assuming that mo- he wrote most of that stuff. You know, because everything was kind of public domain right. among the blues guys back yeah. in those days. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're, I guess that's a tidy list for you. Yeah, it's a Warren good one. Zevon. Warren Zevon. Put Warren yeah. Zevon in there, yeah. Yeah. Tom Waits, Where before he started London? banging on the pots and pans. Um, fantastic. Uh, what about your own routine? Do you have like a morning routine that helps you be creative? I know you now have a YouTube channel and you're promoting... You know, you're sort of connecting with your audience through the Monday morning coffee thing. Yeah. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Is it, Are mornings important? Mornings when I do my best work, yeah. I get tired easily. I went through a little bit of cancer nonsense a couple of years ago. Had to go through a bunch of treatments, and uh, residually I get tired easily, um, easier, and um, and so... You know, I get up fairly early, you know, 536, and my best work happens by noon. You know, that's that's when I'm clicking. And then rules are made to be broken. If I suddenly feel like playing guitar at 7 in the evening, I'll do it. Yeah. And you got those notebooks around. And the notebooks are around. And guitars, there's... There's probably seven guitars in the living room right now. Okay, let's talk about lyric writing in terms of, um, you know, uh, telling versus showing. What does it mean to you to know that the lyric um, does the right thing in a song? And, you know, when do you look at a lyric in your own song and go like, oh, man, that is crap. What the, that's terrible. I can't say that. Well, it has to sing well. It's not. A word in a poem, it's not a piece of prose, it's a song. It has to sing well. Does it have to make perfect sense? Not at all. Does it have to be funny? Not at all. Does it have to be anything at all? In English, not at all. All it has to do is sing well and retain the same singable magic when you discover what the words are. Um, Obviously, there's got to be a good sentiment at the core of what the lyric is, too, Uh, as opposed to kill mommy and daddy there. It has to be, I love mommy and daddy. There, There has to be, you know, one way or the other, sentiment-wise, in the line. But uh, but it's got to sing well. Simply yeah. as that, you know. Um, what about music that's got you excited today? Are there, um, w- what sort of things in music or that you're seeing happen in music kind of turn you on right now? Uh, I listen to Little Steven's Underground Garage on Sirius to keep my sanity. Because this is a very melancholy business we're in right now. Um, the rock and roll generation is getting is either on or getting near Medicare age. And what the kids are listening to now, um, listen to me, what the kids are listening to now, um, it, it is based with a hip hop flavor that doesn't sound abnormal to them it's what music is 
you know, and I like some of it, but I'm a rock and roll guy with a four, four drum sound in my head. And that's what I like to do. And, uh, so what's going on with the kids? I know very little bit about, very little about, uh, but I do know the new rockers. There's a guy named Nick Piunti from Wisconsin who's really good. He's got a great record out called Temporary High. Uh, the Dolly Rots are pretty good. Uh, Paul Myra Del Ran is pretty good. Um, Freedy Johnston is out there making music and writing songs, and and I'm glad he's still out there. Um because, like I said, it's a melancholy business now. The record sales are for shit. There's, uh, there's, it's a dying industry in a way, in a way. In another way, it's a thriving industry because everybody is able to make a record now, which is bad. <laughs> there are a lot of people who shouldn't be making records. I've heard them. Um, I've, I shouldn't have made a few. Um, um, <laughs> what about, you know, the industry and the, the changes? Um, that was one of my questions was, um, you know, how has releasing and promoting your music changed from when you were in government cheese and the biscuits and daddy or to now, you know, with daddy and, and your own records. I mean, I've, there's some pretty obvious answers to that too. But um, you are continuing to make records. You're continuing to play shows and get out there and do your thing. What would you? What, what more comments would you like to say about that? About the change and how you? How well, you? Well, the change in how that? you promote your product and distribute your product and press your product and record your product is that you got to pay for it yourself. Publicity is going to cost you, you know, upwards of eight grand. Radio promotion is going to cost you about a grand. And that that's the low end. That's the le that's the economic level I carry truck in. Pressing the CDs is going to cost you about 3500 depending on how many you get. Recording the record could cost anywhere between uh, two thousand and ten thousand dollars, depending on what you're going to do. Add it up. You got to pay for it. That's what's going on. That there ain't no record labels anymore. That's going to make your life heaven for a year, get you a tour bus, put you out on the road, paying for it all. And then one day they don't even tell you. They don't even give you a phone call. You find out in the paper that you've been dropped. And you uh, and it's all over, and it's like being jilted by the most beautiful lover you've ever known. That was the old paradigm. These days, you pay for everything yourself, and the only good part of it is nobody can tell you what to put in your song and whatnot. Yeah. Well, when you decide to make a record, how much of that is a process of you pausing and thinking forward through the full budget and deciding what you want to do, and how much is just go for it and get get it started, and then keep crossing each little bridge as you get to it. This is the record I'm working on right now is the first record where I, I have been thinking I'll just cross each bridge as I come to it. I I don't anticipate having the re, the way I'm recording right now, just going from guy to guy and doing a song at a time. Probably take me two 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 more years of doing this. But I'm 56, 2 years to me is like a month. Right. And and uh and there's no need to put a record out re oh, too frequently. Um, and it's, you know, and will, will I pay for all the PR and the radio promotion and the pressings and the sessions? Will I pay for all that to have it done so that anybody in the world knows that the damn thing exists? Doubtful. My next record will probably come out very humbly under my own flag, and it'll fly under the radar like all my other stuff does. And um, um, I'll continue on my path of being the slowest rising rock god in the world. <laughs> Life will not change. But 
everybody wants to, everybody got to remember when you're making your record, the record is not going to change your life anymore. You're going to have a few weeks where people will write articles on you in the paper. You'll get some plays on radio. If you hit the Death Star just right using the Force, Luke, yes, you will get rich and famous. But the rest of you 999,999 and a half people are going to have a few nice articles in the paper. You're going to get a little airplay. You'll have a few gigs more than usual, and then it's going to stop, and then you got to do it again yourself in another year or two years or however long you have to wait to be able to take it anymore. Right. <laughs> and that may sound a little harsh, but welcome to Nashville. Well, it's good advice, too, because it reminds us to be encouraged by the process of making the music and let that fuel our moving forward with what we do, you know? Mm -hmm. And and the uh, the next level of what happens with your music and get and having seeing seeing success with it and stuff like that is, you know, accompanies that. But you got to start yeah. from just the love of doing it. I think. Oh yeah, if you, if you don't love doing this, you deserve to be in a nut house. Yeah. Um, if if you if yeah you love is what it's all about. Love and friends. Love and friends. I got a lot of friends making music, and I love knowing them all. And I get such a kick out of uh, just the fact that I know them, and they like me and like how I play. That that's that's my reward, day in day out. It ain't the money. Um, you mentioned that if you do set a budget for radio promotion and for PR. You know, you, you threw out numbers like $8,000 for PR, $1,000 for radio promotion. Um, briefly, if you were to describe what those are to somebody who's never done that before, how would you describe what those two things are? Well, a publicist takes your record and sends copies of it to journalists on a long list and then calls the journalists to see if they want to write about the record that they just sent them. And most of the time they don't, but some of the time they score bit like basketball and uh that so you'll have a few um articles written about you interviews uh they will also promote upcoming shows in towns and get you in magazines uh in those towns you're touring the radio person will send copies of your cds to radio stations and call them incessantly asking the station to play this particular track, we're trying to get it into the charts. And um, that that is what a radio promos, promotion person does. So it's really, it's, you're hiring somebody to just put in the, the smiling and dialing time. Exactly. The hard work of just following through and doing all this busy work to make sure it happens. Exactly. And hopefully have connections and know who to call and all that kind of stuff. Too. You can either hire cheaply with someone who doesn't get their calls returned, or you can pay an arm and a leg to, for somebody who does. There you go. So what's the result you want? I guess that'll help you determine which way to go. Yeah. And what's the result you can afford? Yeah. You know, I don't, I'm, this is going to sound like I'm, I, I feel like I got curmudgeonly for a second there that, uh, you know, it, it is, it's a harsh business. But but it's not either. Um, every it's it's probably a blessing that there's not any more money to be made in this second string Americana cult artist business because everybody's so nice. There's no there's no money to crawl over somebody else's dead body to get to. Every, you know that everybody's supportive of each other because hey, what are they taking from me? There's they're not going to steal that record deal from me. What record deal? You know, how you doing? Give people a hug. That's that's the scene we got here. And um, the days of the record labels, all oh, those were romantic days of tour support and tour buses and videos on television. But and uh, and that's gone except for the Disney Channel. Uh, so far as videos <laughs> and things. Um, but the joy of still making the music is never going to die and it's never going to get wiped out and it's never going to 
uh, it's never going to end for me. I'm going to perform until I, you know, I'm not the healthiest guy in the world anymore, but I'm going to perform till I drop. And uh, be blessed that I'm playing with some of the finest musicians in Nashville, which means the finest musicians in the world. It's a cool place to be. Yeah. Well, Tommy, thank you so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us, dude. It has been been my pleasure. It's been fun hanging with you. Um, Yeah. Let the rock stars know again where they can find you online. TommyWomack.com, T O M M Y W O M A C K.com, or Facebook.com slash Tommy Womack. And uh, uh, those are the two main places. Awesome. And uh, rock stars, you're going to find Tommy's fantastic books there um again like you said you can also just get them directly on amazon Mm -hmm. we'll try and include links in the show notes um so that you can go straight to those and then also tommy's records tons of them there so great stuff man tommy thanks so much for being on the show with us it's been a total pleasure hanging out with you it's been great seeing you lidge it's been too long plenty of things we didn't talk about but (laughs) we'll have you back on down the down the road sure all right man thanks so much dude cheers take care Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio. Just look for the link in the show notes below. Thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music